Hello. I think, you know, sort of walking and talking will be good. Um, and then maybe at some point we'll, you know, sit quietly and talk a bit. Okay. If you're open to that. I am. I have until 11.30. That's totally fine. All right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a pretty one. And what's, what's that? Appendaged water leaf or great water leaf because it's the greatest water leaf. It really is. There are other, several other species, but smaller flowers, blah, kind of looking, frankly. This is just a gorgeous one. Look at those flowers. Wow. Yeah, that's, that sort of lavender. Mm -hmm. It's an exuberant, just sort of so many buds and flowers on one plant. And that's a really small plant. A big plant can be, you know, two feet around with just dozens and dozens of flowers hanging on it. And there's one yep. surviving in the midst of the yeah. nettles. <laughs> Good luck, Gutty. <laughs> Botanists are so used to this phenological calendar that we know when things are going to be flowering. And when we see things that are flowering a full month earlier than they used to, it's hard not to see that and, and realize that has implications. I mean, we all love seeing flowers, so, you know, seeing them earlier in the year, that's great. But they're supposed to have pollinators, and the insects that are pollinating them aren't necessarily following the same schedule that the plants are. The plants are tuned into day length and temperature. And insects, you know, may have a different calendar. So if we've got plants flowering and the pollinators aren't out yet, that's a big problem. When I started working for the Nature Conservancy, I took a trip up to near Michigan City, Indiana, where we had a beautiful fen called Trail Creek Fen. And I went up with the steward that handled that site and we walked happily through the fen in our rubber boots because it was mucky and there was skunk cabbage and there was marsh marigold and there was all kinds of stuff there. And then I got to this part of the fen and there was this huge shrub. It was about eight feet tall and about eight feet wide. And it was, it was massive. And I thought, I do not know what this thing is. I started looking in guides and nothing, there were no flowers to look at at that point. And I could not figure out what it was. And then I looked around the base of it and I saw hundreds and hundreds of little shrublings that were clearly the same species as whatever this was. And I realized, oh no, this has got to be something non-native and it must be invasive because look at all of this. And finally, we put together all the cues we could. We, we looked in the guide and we came out to, it was privet. It really struck at my heart because this was a fen that had lady slipper orchids. It had all this stuff. And as those little privet shrubs were going to grow, they were going to completely shade that stuff out. And what really made the biggest impression on me, as I was kind of stomping out of the fen back to the truck, thinking about how much time and energy it was going to take the steward to cut out that big one and then deal with the smaller ones, I finally raised my eyes and I looked at the neighbor. The neighboring property was a house about 100 yards away, and they had a hedge. And that hedge was eight foot tall privet all around the house. For the first time, it was truly clear how landscaping with invasive plants was really decimating our nature preserve. I haven't been back there in years, but I'm, I'm wondering what it looks like now because it's, it's not an easy thing to engage with a neighbor and convince them to get rid of a very large hedge. And I, I was afraid that the future was not bright for that fen.
I'm Ellen Jacart. I am a retired ecologist and spend my time hiking and, and looking at wildflowers and doing native landscaping in my yard. We are in McCormick's Creek State Park. It is late spring, uh, kind of late May, where a lot of the early spring wildflowers have started to fade, but the late spring wildflowers are in full glorious bloom. How long have you been coming to McCormick's Creek? Oof. Just about 50 years. Yeah, that's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and has it changed? Well, um, probably the biggest change that I notice is when I walk through 50 years ago, there were little dirt paths. Those were the trails. And then about 30 years ago, they decided, no, these need to be bigger trails to accommodate the increasing people that were coming to enjoy the park. And it turned into uh, gravel trails that were, you know, 10 feet wide. And then more people came and the gravel wasn't holding up well. So they decided that they needed to make them wider and asphalt. So now much of the park, what used to be small trails, it, it kind of looks like county roads going through them without the dashed line in the middle. So the, the trails have gotten bigger, which has kind of broken up the forest even more. And there's still a problem with the deer population. The deer had been identified as a problem at McCormick's Creek State Park many years ago, 40, 40 years ago. And they've tried to reduce the population, but it hasn't been um, as successful as it should be. So we find that a lot of the most palatable species, the things that deer want to eat, kind of disappear. And we get more and more nettles. We're going to see a lot of nettles. And what are some of the ones that they have been eating? Oh, the trilliums. They love the trilliums. The orchids, the showy orchis is, is a nice late spring uh, flower, and it's really unlikely we're going to see one today because deer just love uh, orchids, and so uh, those are pretty much gone. The the ones that hang on are like the Guyandot beauty because it's a mint and it tastes funny. The deer don't tend to eat it as much, so that we still have. Another change we've seen is there used to be huge ash trees here. And, you know, 25 years ago, they were still standing, but they were all dead due to the emerald ash borer. So slowly those giants toppled and made big holes in the canopy. New species came up. Um, not as many oaks as, as were in the canopy before, because these small light gaps don't really help oak species that much but um, so we've got um, an uneven aged forest now because we lost so many of those large trees there's lots of little patches of young trees filling in behind the ash that all died hmm. and did the ashes die in the 20 teens was it yeah um Emerald ash borer first came in in 2001 in Michigan, 2005 in Indiana, I believe. And really the first ash deaths in this area of McCormick's Creek, oh gosh, it was probably um, 2015 or so. And okay. then they slowly died one by one. I see. Uh, yeah, let's go down the, should we go down here at the paper path? Okay, great. So did people just realize with the ash borer that it was just inevitable? Yeah. In the early years, there was this sense of somehow we would keep it from moving outside of Detroit where it came in. Mm. And they set up what they called fire breaks where they would go in and on a very large scale remove all ash trees for like a mile wide uh, this was in northern Indiana, to try and keep it from coming in. And 
that did not work. <laughs> and so it came in and slowly spread um, through the state, moving to the south. And uh, now it's pretty well established. Um, and we've got very few ash trees left. There's one species called blue ash. And there's some of that in this park. And it doesn't seem as susceptible to emerald ash borer. So there's still blue ash, but the white ash, the green ash, black ash, and pumpkin ash pretty much all died. McCormick's Creek State Park is a big state park, and the first state park created in Indiana. And it's known for having just spectacular plants, uh, native plants and, and spring wildflower displays in particular. And I remember being there, you know, when I was younger and just being blown away by the number of species and then the, just the sheer um, display, the, the swaths, the swords of, of native plants. There's a place you can go, or you used to go. Um, there were a couple of big old logs, sycamores, that had come down and just kind of crisscrossed uh, in this low area, which was right next to the stream that flows into McCormick's Creek. So you've got this creekside location. And all along the way, you're seeing Green Dragon and Jack in the Pulpit and Spring beauty and celandine poppy and all of the beautiful, you know, spring ephemerals. And later in the season, as those have just started to fade, the pink turtle head would come out. And until it's in flower, you don't even notice that plant because it's it's about a foot tall. It's not huge. The, fly, the leaves are not real noticeable. But then suddenly it comes into flower and it's called turtle head because the flower looks like a turtle head on end, like the mouth of the turtle is sticking up into the sky. And the common species is the cream-colored turtle head, which is a nice little plant. But pink turtle head? You've got all these little pink turtle heads. And it's like a field of them as you're walking along the trail, hundreds and hundreds of plants. And a, a site that you wouldn't see anywhere else in Indiana, because it really is a pretty rare plant, but just an absolute abundance of it as you just walk through and, and look at those beautiful plants. And what were some of the, um, the shrubs and plants that did used to be here? Well, there used to be uh, nodding trillium, lots and lots of nodding trillium, prairie trillium, toad shade. Those are uh, also trillium species. Oh, this used to be a place for putty root orchid. There was putty root orchid everywhere, which is one of those strange uh, winter orchids. We have a couple of orchids in Indiana that they put out their new leaf in late fall and it overwinters because, uh, you know, plenty of sun is coming through because the trees don't have any leaves on. Right. It's photosynthesizing all winter. Then come next May, it puts up the shoot of orchid flowers, about a foot tall, uh, and then the flowers get pollinated, they produce their fruits, and that leaf that was out all winter is shriveling up and dying, so it really doesn't even have a leaf in the summer. Come fall, new leaf goes out. And there was so much putty root in this uh, state park. Huh. Uh, it's a really cool one. Wow, I'd love to see that. So trillium's putty root. Uh, oh, what's that? This. <gasps> you got it. That's putty root. That's putty root. That's why I can't believe Amazing. you did that. In the midst of nettles, you can't grab it. But so I don't even see the leaf at the base. It's completely dead, brown. Oh, wait, there it is. There it is. That's the putty root oh, leaf that yeah. was out all winter. Familiar orchid leaf. I was really looking for that, hoping we would see it. There it is. That's the putty root orchid. It's getting pollinated right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then it will turn into little hanging fruit brown pods that have the seeds. Okay. Um, how fun. Yeah. <laughs> right. There are places 
um, where there, there is a lot today. Oh. Um, but uh, it can be hard to see because it kind of, especially if it's just brown back there, it kind of blends in and you don't notice it given the color of, uh, of those flowers, kind of a crimson, dark brown slash yellowish green. Yeah, it's it's a sort of, I feel like it's a strange and unusual stalk and flowers, but the flowers themselves aren't particularly exciting. No, you have to kind of get up close and then look into uh, them to yeah. see the complexity of an orchid flower. Right. Yeah, I can see that close up. So when I was working, you know, 40, 50 years ago, the single biggest hazard that our workers had out in the field was, was ticks and, and tick-related illnesses. As the years went by, we saw an incredible increase, not only in the number of ticks that we saw, in the range of the ticks, because when I started my career, Lone Star ticks were known from counties in southern Indiana near the Ohio River. The Lone Star ticks are now all over the Indiana Dunes National Park. So they've expanded their ranges. The populations are higher in part because the um, invasive shrubs have uh, really dominated the understory of a lot of our forest systems. And, and when those shrubs make that sort of dense thicket in the understory, it provides cover uh, for the small mammals, for the deer, who are the hosts for the ticks. So there were a couple of groundbreaking studies back 50 years ago that um, pointed out that if you go in and you count the number of ticks in a forest that has Asian bush honeysuckle in the understory, and then you remove all the Asian bush honeysuckle and you go back and you count the ticks, there's a significant reduction in the, the number of ticks. And what it means for people is that the public health office notes that there's a significant reduction in the tick-carried uh, illnesses. And, and those include not just Lyme disease, which is pretty well known, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which has been a bad problem in southern Indiana, but also ehrlichiosis and some others that I can't even remember the names. It's, it seemed like about every five years or so, a new disease was identified that we didn't realize before, that the field workers had had it, and, but nobody knew what it was. And then they would trace it, and it would be traced to a tick and it would be a new uh, tick-carried illness. As that threat spread and more and more people became aware of the health implication of invasives, they actually were able to pass more stringent regulations so that plants that were going to be sold had to, to go through an assessment and shown to be non-invasive before they could be sold. But it wasn't magic pixie dust that just made all the invasives already out there on the landscape disappear. And they didn't disappear. They seemed to do better with climate change. The slightly higher CO2, the earlier growing season is something that invasive species can often adapt to better than native plants. And so where we had invasions... They continued to spread unless the landowner or the public agency was willing to go in and control those invasives. And, you know, they had to make hard choices. I think in, in those years, agencies in particular became a lot more strategic about, we've got all of these acres, where do we have enough money to spend and be able to remove the invasives and protect the biodiversity that we have? And so, you know, in, in most public areas now, you'll see almost sort of what you might call sacrifice areas that have just grown up in Oriental bittersweet and Asian bush honeysuckle. But where there was diversity, the nicest areas, they've drawn a line and that's where they focus their efforts so that we still have some remnants that you can walk to and, and see what things look like once upon a time before invasives really took over much of the landscape. Hi. Hi. Hello. Having a good hike? 
<laughs> we're seeing some of the spring ephemerals that are now fading, like the May apple flowers. Oh, we've got the ferns that are coming out. Here's a nice fern. Look at this. Oh, I love this one. This is glade fern. It is um, just this tall tufts of ferns and uh, just simple pinnae on the frond. And uh, it's, it's a fern that really likes moist woods. And that's what this is. And importantly, deer don't eat ferns almost ever. In ancient history, when Brown County State Park had such high deer populations that the hills were actually brown, that was 1989, and it was my first year in Indiana, and I could not believe, in the middle of summer, I was seeing these huge hills that were brown. The only green left was Christmas fern and a few other ferns that the deer refused to eat. What was really most dramatic about Greens Bluff Nature Preserve and what drew attention to it and what got it protected by the Nature Conservancy, boy, back in the 1960s, were the hemlocks. There were these gorgeous remnant stands of hemlock lining the bluffs. And they were there because in the last, uh, when the glaciers were there, it was cool enough, it was wet enough, they established. And as the glaciers receded, they held on in these little ridges and canyons where they were protected from the heat of the middle of the day. And they were beautiful. And then as the years went on, they stopped reproducing so much. We just weren't seeing young, young hemlocks in the stand anymore. And we figured that that tied to climate change and that we were seeing mortality among some of the older uh, hemlocks. And well, maybe it's just too warm. It's too dry in late summer due to the changes we were seeing in the climate. And that was not helping but the final nail in the coffin was hemlock woolly adelgid. That's a, a little bug, looks like a kind of a mealy bug, that attacks hemlocks specifically. And we had been waiting for it to arrive in Indiana for decades, hoping that it would stay away because we are hundreds of miles from the closest hemlock stand in Kentucky. And we had hoped we were safe. Unfortunately, it came in the way I was afraid it would. People are buying hemlocks for landscaping, and they're coming from Tennessee and North Carolina, both of which are covered in hemlock woolly adelgid. And so some hemlock woolly adelgid came in on one of those landscaping shrubs, uh, landscaping trees, and then it moved out into Green's Bluff. And so, oh... It was about 10 years ago, the last one pretty much died. Do you remember the moment when you realized that it had come to Indiana? Yep, because I'm, I have been for many years. They, they send out reports from the Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. I used to work with them as, as a partner, and every time there's a new insect pest, they send out a report, and I saw that report, and my heart sank, and I had... <laughs> tried for years to get that division to put an external quarantine on hemlock, meaning that we would not bring hemlock into the state because of that very risk. We saw twice in Michigan that it was landscaping hemlocks that brought hemlock woolly adelgid into Michigan, and now they're fighting it. But they didn't do a quarantine, and those hemlocks kept coming in, and it finally spelled the end of hemlock in Indiana. That's unfortunate. Idiots. I'll just put you in here. Had a few roots on it, and they're pretty good at rerooting, so. And what is that? Wild ginger. Oh, I should have shown you. Wild ginger, that's the flower, and a fruit is being produced there. But, and if it can reroot, maybe those seeds will finish ripening and be able to start 
Mm -hmm. More plants. It's a real shallow rooted plant. Hmm. I use it a lot in my landscaping because it makes like right there, it's a beautiful carpet of wild yeah. ginger. So that's kind of a lot of my landscaping. One thing I was thinking about was like the pink turtle head, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, having pretty much lost that in the recent decades um, and how when you, you know, the first couple decades of you being here, it was just this vast swath of amazing pink flowers. And not to sound callous, but like it's one kind of plant and it's one small spot. You know, what does it matter, I guess? Yeah, boy, I've gotten that question over the years. And I guess, you know, there are different ways of looking at it. You know, if you're a spiritual person, these are amazing plants, plant species that have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and have this intricate relationship with the pollinators and the wildlife that eat the fruits. And, and it's a part of a network. And by pulling out an individual species, it changes all of that connections. And it's just like a car. If you have a car and you pull off a windshield wiper, well, it'll still drive just fine and you got one wiper. And then if you take, you know, the steering wheel and, well, that's a little difficult to make it go. And, and as you remove one piece after another, it just gets harder and harder for the system to actually function. And ultimately, from a selfish perspective, these systems support us. These systems are what keep human, the human race going by cleaning our water, by providing oxygen, all of these different things that nature is doing for us. And if we're basically tearing it apart to the point where it no longer functions, we are harming ourselves. So there's a lot of uh, uses beyond simply the fact that all living beings, I believe, have the right to survive. Well, that was a little excessive. I will, I will step back from that. All species have a right to survive. The evolution that created those species should be respected. And individuals are going to die. But when you start seeing whole populations blinking out, that's kind of the canary in the coal mine. You're seeing real impacts and reasons that that species can't survive. That should be a red flag to us about well, what about the human species? What's, what's causing all of these extirpations of native plant species? And what does that mean for humans? Okay, so we, here's the park office, and back here, you cross the road to mm -hmm. Trail 2. Okay. You go down, there's a split off to see the old quarry, which is worth seeing. It's fun. A lot of, a lot of history there. The limestone was loaded onto boats on the creek. Oh, wow. Cool. And, but if you go straight, <clears throat> what I recall kind of in this area, it's before you get close to the, the McCormick's Creek. If this is a low area, mm -hmm. there's some down trees and it's just kind of wet mm -hmm. and mushy, that's where the um, uh, pink turtle head is. So that should be it right there, unless I'm misremembering. So oh, right thanks. Mm -hmm. Because you probably know this place well enough. Well, I've got multiple maps. I always grab ones. extra ones. Cause, really? Yeah, it's because sometimes it's like, well, wait, does that trail connect to that trail? Yeah, like right. if I do this and so yeah, yeah I have extras. <laughs> cool. All right. Bye, Alan. This is How to Survive the Future, a show about today from an imagined tomorrow. 
The show is produced by me, Alex Chambers, in collaboration with Allison Quantz, whose editorial vision and all-around insight made the show possible. Allison also came up with our title. Our theme music is Soft Skin by Amy Olsner. We have additional music from Ramon Monras Sender, Backward Collective and Last Ledges, and Airport People. Thanks to Molly Weiler and Kate Young for additional editorial support. Special thanks to Ellen Jaycart for imagining herself into the future. How to Survive the Future is produced in partnership with Indiana Humanities, with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and with further support from the Writers Guild at Bloomington. Thanks for listening.